والله يدعو الى دار السلام ويهدي من يشاء الى صراط مستقيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Peace and Allah's uh, mercy be upon you. Welcome to Universal Quran. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala Rasulillah. All praise belongs to Allah alone, and we pray for His blessing and peace upon His Messenger, uh, Muhammad. Uh, this is Universal Quran, where we examine the Quran from its tafsir, its interpretation and explanation. We try to follow the correct methodology in understanding the original intended meaning of these revelations. Because the Qur'an, even though it was revealed more than 1,400 years ago, but it is meant to be applied in every situation that we may face in every time and in every place. We have to understand the revelation in the original context in which it was revealed. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His mercy and wisdom, has preserved for us the Qur'an in its original meaning and text, exactly as it was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah's blessing and peace be upon him. In order to understand the original meaning, though, we have to examine the, what the scholars of the Arabic language have said about the meanings of the terms as they were understood by the first generation of Muslims, as well as what were the circumstances when particular verses were revealed uh, at that time. Furthermore, we have to compare different verses of the Qur'an to each other. Each one uh, brings part of an intended meaning. Each one supports and backs up and explains the other verses, as well as the fact that the Prophet, in his hadith, in the narrations which are collected in the collections, authentic collections of hadith, or prophetic narrations, explains to us the meaning of many different terms and many different uh, verses of the Qur'an, as well as living for us as an example of the general message of the Qur'an to all of mankind. So by looking at the person of the Prophet Wasallam, his actions, his deeds, the things which were done and interpreted by his companions, the first generation, which he approved of, we can get a full, complete understanding uh, with Allah's help of the scripture of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Currently, we are wrapping up the final section of the Holy Quran, Juz 30. Today, we're going to be uh, reading two of the short surahs or chapters of the Quran, chapter 107, Al Ma'un, and chapter 108, Al Kawthar. Uh, our brother Fayruz is a, a reciter of the Holy Quran. He's been studying the Quran for several years now. He's going to recite the verses for us in the original Arabic language. And Brother Bilal from Canada is going to recite the English interpretation of the meanings of these verses. So, uh, Fayruz, we'll read the first three verses. A'udhu billahi minash rajim بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أرأيت الذي يكذب بالدين فذلك الذي يدع اليتيم ولا يحض على طعام المسكين I seek refuge with Allah from Shaitan the outcast in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. Have you seen him who denies the recompense? That is he who repulses the orphan harshly and urges not the feeding of the poor. Thank you. In these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was uh, directing them to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself. O Muhammad, it is in the sing singular. Have you seen him who denies the recompense or denies judgment? or the idea of reward and punishment. What is an example of the person who denies the judgment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It's not simply a matter of saying, I believe in the last days, I believe in the resurrection of the dead, or I believe in judgment, or that we will be rewarded in paradise, or punished in hellfire for whatever we've done. But you have to demonstrate your belief, whether you truly believe it or not. Your beliefs will be demonstrated in actions. So 
as I've said previously, the person who believes the fire is hot will demonstrate that belief by avoiding touching the fire and getting burnt by it. And the person who doubts the reality of the fire will easily put his hand into it without any fear. So, of course, young children, young babies have to be told to stay far away from the hot stove or the hot fire because they don't know yet. They don't know the reality of the fire. And so their parents have to direct them and remind them. But the best way of teaching them is to get their hand very close to it and then they feel it's hot. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted us intelligence. He's granted us discernment to make decisions based on evidence. If we make the correct decision, we will understand reality and then we will act according to reality. So every human being has a concept or worldview of what they believe is the reality. And the truth is that some people believe that Jannah and Nar, heaven and hell, or paradise and hellfire are part of reality and other people do not. And you can tell regardless of what their words are by how they act and what their deeds are and the choices they make. So, the, so Allah SWT was saying to the Prophet Wasallam, have you seen him, that person, any general person, not a specific individual who denies the idea of judgment or reward and punishment? And then he gives examples of those people. The person who harshly rebukes the orphan. As we have read in previous surahs, the Prophet himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was an orphan. His father died before he was even born. And his mother, Amina, died when he was five or six years of age. And so the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, himself was very um, close to the feeling of the orphans and widows. And Islam has commanded us in so many different verses to care for, to feed the hungry, and to care for the orphan and the widow. The Prophet ﷺ said in an authentic hadith in Sahih Bukhari, one of the most authentic collections of the narratives of the Prophet ﷺ, that I and the person who looks after the orphan uh, on the, uh, in Jannah, in paradise, will be, and he put his two fingers together, we will be like that. The person who desires to be close to the Prophet ﷺ will be the one who looks after the orphan. We all say, well, oh, we wish that we could have lived with the Prophet ﷺ. We wish that we could have seen him in his time like the Sahaba and be blessed with actually meeting the Prophet ﷺ. But we can't choose that. We can choose to be close to the Prophet ﷺ in the future, if not now. But by following his advice now, in the future, inshallah, with Allah's help, we can be close to him in paradise. And also in the collection of Bukhari, uh, the Prophet ﷺ talked about the man who cares for widows and orphans and the poor that his reward is like the reward of the person who struggles in the path of Allah SWT, or the person who devotes the entire night to prayer and the entire day to fasting. And none of us are able to spend 24 hours a day praying and fasting. Nobody can do that. But by helping orphans and widows and poor, we can get that reward and a greater reward with Allah SWT. When we look at these pictures of refugees and people who are suffering from famine, from starvation, refugees, uh, orphans f whose parents have been killed in these uh, terrible calamities, man-made calamities like war and, and natural calamities like droughts. We have to realize that, first of all, the majority of them throughout the world are Muslims. And very often, the people who are caring for them aren't even Muslims. But government, non-governmental agencies, religious agencies, for example, Christian missions, will come and care for these orphans and feed them and clothe them and educate them. And of course, at the same time, teach them their way of life. It's natural that a human being would love the person who came and saved his life. And so if the person who came and saved your life was not a Muslim, but a person who disbelieved in Allah SWT, you may be tempted then to follow that person's belief because that person is an example to you of a caring and compassionate person. So unfortunately, throughout the world, millions and millions of Muslims are suffering, and very often their own brothers are negligent in responding to their suffering and helping them, even though Allah SWT said that Failing to do so is a sign that we disbelieve. It's a sign that we don't believe that we're going to be asked by Allah SWT, how did we spend our money? How did we spend our, our, our food? Did we waste it? Did we eat ourselves until we're overweight and then throw away the leftover food? Did we show off by having great banquets and then wasting uh, very valuable food that could go to the poor and the needy? Or did we take and share the extra of what we had with those who are less fortunate? Alhamdulillah, there are throughout the Islamic world charitable organizations which care for widows and orphans and poor people throughout the world. And it's very easy for us to help those organizations and support them. And they will take that money and go directly to those people and help them and care for them. And it takes a minimal effort on our, 
uh, for our, on our own uh, side to, to help those people. And in fact, a very small amount of money, which is really worthless to us, that we might spend on one cup of coffee in uh, an espresso cafe as we have in the West, that might save a person's life. That might cause that person to not die one day because they have food and water uh, and, and safety and security. So we have a responsibility as Muslims that our belief in judgment means that we take care of our fellow Muslims here in this world today. And that is the sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided you. And that's the sign that you are one who merits closeness to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in the hereafter. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa has promised that to us. And so if we truly desire, desire that, we will live that inshallah. Uh, this surah is a short surah. It continues up until uh, verse 7. So if you could just read those for us in Arabic. فَوَيْلٌ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنْ صَلَاتِهِمْ سَاهُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ يُرَاءُونَ وَيَمْنَعُونَ الْمَاعُونَ Thank you. Yeah? So woe unto those performers of prayers who delay their prayers from their fixed from their stated fixed times, those who do good deeds only to be seen of men and refuse small kindness. Uh, these verses are continuing on the description of those people who are denying or in denial of the idea of resurrection and judgment. People who are, are, are hypocrites or munafiqun, those people who appear to be one thing in reality within themselves they are another thing. Outwardly they may appear to be Muslims, people of faith, who pray and do other good deeds, fasting and, and other things, but inwardly they do not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they are in denial or rejection of the idea of judgment and resurrection that they will be held responsible by their Creator for their behavior here on earth. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warned us about people who are praying, but they're not really praying and their prayer isn't the real prayer, it's the prayer of hypocrites. Ibn Abbas understands that. And Ibn Abbas, of course, was the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu as a young child, the Prophet prayed on his behalf that Allah would grant him the knowledge and understanding of our religion. And he is one of the great uh, interpreters of the Holy Quran or the science of tafsir. And he said that this is the person who pay, play, prays in public and not in private. The person who prays. And that is, of course, by the, 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 the other verses that he prays to be seen of people. But when he's in private, when he's in his home, he's not interested in Salat at all, but only when there are people watching him. And that is called a riya, or eye service, praying to be seen by the eyes of human beings. But also, as indicated in the translation of this verse that you just read, uh, it's also those people who needlessly delay the prayer. The prayers have specific fixed times. And sometimes the end time of that prayer is actually makruh, or it is disliked in Islam to delay. So for example, the Asr prayer, uh, the mid-afternoon prayer, it is disliked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you would delay it unnecessarily because the, the latter part of that prayer is the sunset when people used to worship the sun. And so the Prophet ﷺ said that the prayer of the hypocrite is the one who delays, waits until the sun is ready to set, then he gets up and quickly, like a crow pecking the ground, pecking the seeds of the ground, goes through the movements, and does not have any tranquility in his prayer. We'll cut to the break and we'll be back to finish the explanation of this surah with Jazakumullahu Khairan. <laughs> learning how to recite the Qur'an properly, learning the meaning of what we recite, concluding the ahkam from the verses which we recite, trying to implement what we learn in our daily life. We we'll listen to the participants and the guests. We'll take your phone calls. We're going to recite life. We'll listen to your recitation. And we'll correct it according to the rules and regulations which we'll state in each episode. Now, your dream will come true. Will come true. In
Welcome back to Universal Quran. We are studying from chapter 107, Al Ma'un. Uh, before the break, we discussed the idea of riyah, or praying to be seen of people. And the Prophet ﷺ described in a hadith found in uh, Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, the two most authentic collections of his hadith or narrations, that the prayer of the hypocrite is one who waits till the last minute to pray, then gets up lazily, goes through the motions quickly without any feeling of tranquility or contentment or humility before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and remembers Allah but little. And in that he's quoting from the verse in chapter 4, Anissa, verse 142, about the, the hypocrite who stands for prayer only out of laziness and to be seen by people and remembers Allah but little. Just going through the motions and not really thinking about the meaning and importance of what he is doing. Now, Riyah is... Uh, true, pure riyah is not praying at all. If you're praying so that people will see you or doing any other Islamic deed so that people will only see you, then you're not doing it for Allah's sake. You're doing it for the sake of people and there is no reward for that. But that is, that is the prayer of a hypocrite. But there's another thing which happens to some people which they do something sincerely. They pray or do other good deeds sincerely but people happen to see them and praise them and so they feel good about that. And that is not riyah. That is... Uh, 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 simply that you know you do some things uh, with the intention of Allah, but they're seen by the public. And in fact, that is mentioned in a hadith found in a Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah to the collections of the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that that person will have two rewards. One reward for doing it with the intention to do it secretly, and the other reward for actually having done it publicly, that people saw him and praised him for that. Because he was an example. Anytime you do a good deed sincerely and people see it, then they may follow your example and also do good deeds. And so you have led them to do something good, which is a continual charity. As long as people follow your example and do good, you'll be rewarded for that, not only in this life, but continually after your death. If people have followed your example, your knowledge, and your actions, then you will have a reward for that, uh, Allah willing, without taking anything from their reward. Now we're going to go on to chapter 108. Al Kawthar. Can you please just read for us the entire three verses of this chapter? A'udhu billahi min ash shaytanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Inna a'tayna kal kawthar. Fasalli li rabbika wanhar. I seek refuge with Allah from Shaytan the outcast in the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful verily we have granted you a river in paradise therefore turn in prayer to your Lord and sacrifice to him only for he who hates you he will be cut off this chapter, a very short chapter of the Holy Quran, al kawthar was revealed in the very early days in Mecca when Muslims were suffering and the Prophet ﷺ was being attacked by his own people, his nearest relations and the leaders of the society of Mecca. They had to endure greatly, but Allah promised them a reward and a victory and a reward in this life as well as in the hereafter. And Allah SWT specifically in this chapter is encouraging the Prophet ﷺ to endure and to be patient and that there is a great reward waiting for him in Jannah, particularly al kawthar al kawthar is a, a body of water or a river of the rivers of paradise which is given to the Prophet ﷺ. This is described in many different uh, hadiths of the Prophet ﷺ. In Sahih Bukhari, the most authentic source of the Prophet's sunnah, he describes it as a river the banks of which are covered with pavilions made of pearls and around which are cups to drink from which are like the stars. I mean, millions, millions of cups. And the, this people come to this and you know, the believers come and are quenched from this on the Day of Judgment. And it's the you know, greatest pleasure when they're able to gather here on the banks of this river with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's just like if you, you can imagine in this earth that a person travels and suffers and uh, endures thirst and hunger crossing a huge desert. And when they get to the end of their journey, they arrive at a beautiful oasis and it's full of 
of rivers and water and, 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 it, and everything beautiful, how they feel. And this is something much, much beyond that. The people have endured uh, their lives and suffering and they've endured uh, the Day of Judgment and now they arrive at Paradise and this is what they get to see. You can just sort of imagine a small glimpse of what this might be like and the feeling of happiness that people will, will see around, that, around it. Uh, the Prophet Sallam narrates that uh, he's going to be there with all of his companions and he'll see a man standing far off, uh, afraid to come closer, and he's shaking with fear to come closer. And Allah will, the Prophet Sallam will say to Allah, He is one of my ummah, he's one of my followers, so let him come close. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to him, You don't know what they have innovated after you. That these people after you left, O Muhammad, have innovated things of this religion which are not part of it. They've innovated new forms of worship, new beliefs which are not the beliefs of the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam, and new practices which are not part of our religion. And so he is to stay far off, far off away from Al-Kawthar. He is not one of your ummah, even though he looks like a Muslim, prays like a Muslim, and does other things like the Islamic religion. This also shows us that Allah is telling him that on the Day of Judgment, uh, there will be things that uh, the Prophet ﷺ was not aware of. There are people who believe that the Prophet ﷺ is in his grave, but has knowledge of the unseen, and he knows everything that's happening in the earth. And this is not true. The Prophet ﷺ passed away, and things are happening today, and he's not aware of those things. And so Allah may reveal those things to him uh, in a future time. For example, when he said, After you, O Muhammad, they innovated matters of your religion. But he was unaware of that. So the Prophet ﷺ does not have awareness of what is going on in the world, but like other people who are deceased, he is at rest. And Allah knows best. But there are people who have, uh, in their belief, raised the Prophet ﷺ above the human level and put him in the level, almost to the level of what Christians have put Christ and other uh, messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that, in fact, is one of the innovations which is being referred to in this hadith, and Allah knows best, that they have innovated uh, the ghulu or the exaggeration in matters of religion, particularly in exaggerated beliefs about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Prophet was given to know this great reward that he had. And this is only one part of the reward of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the hereafter. And Allah said, in response to that, what is our response? To pray and sacrifice. To pray and sacrifice. Also in Surah number 6 in Al-An'am, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta-A'la said, Qul, say, O Muhammad, inna salati wa nusiki wa mahyaya wa mimati lillahi rabbil alameen. That say, my life, my death, or my, my, my prayers, my sacrifice, my life, my life and my death are all for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Uh, in fact, the Prophet used to recite this as part of the opening of his daily prayers and it's sunnah to recite that also in opening your prayers. That everything is for Allah and everything is from Allah. You have the power to pray. Why? Because Allah gave you the power. You have the power to sacrifice because Allah gave you something that you can sacrifice. And your entire life and death are in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And so Allah is saying, pray and sacrifice. This could be the five daily prayers that we pray plus the sunnah of salats that we pray and any other salats, nuaf of salats or extra salats that you may pray from the day and the night. Uh, and also uh, the... Um, Salat of Eid al-Adha, Salat on the day of sacrifice, the 10th day of Dhul Hijjah, during the pilgrimage, when no matter where people are throughout the world, whether they're on pilgrimage or not, they gather and pray the Salat al-Eid, the Salat of the Eid festival, commemorating the sacrifice of Ibrahim, of his son Ismail, and they will sacrifice a cow or a sheep or a camel for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And sacrificing means slaughtering the animal in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, dedicating it only to the name of Allah, and sharing some of the meat with your neighbors and friends and, and people who are poor and needy, all for the sake of, of Islam. And so in that case, this verse is referring to Salat al-Eid, and then immediately after Salat al-Eid, you go out and do the sacrifice or udhiya on that uh, greatest festival of the Islamic calendar. And also from any time when you uh, want to prepare food for a meal, for a feast, for celebrating uh, any occasion and you want to uh, slaughter an animal, you do so in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is also a sacrifice. It's an act of worship that you say the name of Allah upon it and so 
slaughtering an animal is an act of worship. And that is why Muslims are only allowed to eat the meat of food which has been sacrificed in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah said in chapter 6 verse 121, do not eat from that which Allah's name has not been mentioned upon. And so we mention the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and something that's been dedicated to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we do not eat from it, but we abstain from that meat. However, Muslims have been given license by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to eat the meat which has been prepared correctly by Christians or Jewish people. Uh, we're allowed to eat that meat also as long as it has been uh, killed in the humane manner which we're instructed by Islam to sacrifice or slaughter the animal in a humane manner by uh, severing the jugular vein and the uh, windpipe quickly with a very sharp instrument, not allowing the animal to see the knife before it's killed, but uh, not allowing it to feel fear and treating it in a humane way, giving it water before its death, and then allowing the blood to drain out completely from the animal before preparing the meat and eating it. And so Allah SWT is commanding us to uh, pray to him alone and to sacrifice to him alone. In Shaniyaka Huwal Abdar. Those were the people, and there were several different people among the leaders of Quraysh, the Prophet's own clan, the leaders of Mecca, who repudiated him and treated him very harshly. And a very bad thing happened that the Prophet ﷺ had a son who died, and the Prophet ended up with no sons who lived beyond childhood. And so they said, after your child is dead, nobody will remember you. You will die and you have no sons to carry on your name. Your name will be lost. Nobody will remember you. So they said about the Prophet that he, you know, Butira Muhammad, that he, his name will be cut off. He will be lost to posterity. And Allah said, no. Actually, those evil, wicked people who are claiming that, they will be cut off. Their own descendants, their own sons will be praising the Prophet ﷺ, asking for Allah's blessing and peace upon him and honoring his name saying, La ilaha Allah, there is none worthy of worship except Allah, Muhammad Rasul Allah, uh, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, while they will be cursing their own ancestors who fought uh, the Islam and fought the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. So even if they had many, many sons, yet they were the ones who were cut off because their own sons and grandchildren all became Muslims and followed the Prophet wasallam, And so they don't brag about being the descendants of those people, but they brag about their closeness to Allah's Prophet and Messenger. So they were the ones who were truly cut off. Uh, inshallah, Allah will uh, enlighten all of us to further to study the universal Qur'an. May Allah reward and guide all of us. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. وترى الجبال تحسبها جامدة وهي تمر مر السحاب صنع الله الذي أتقن كل شيء إنه خبير بما تفعلون مثل الذين ينفقون أموالهم في سبيل كمثل حبة أنبتت سبع سنابل وكل في فلك يسبحون ويقول